If you like our content, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking that subscribe button. We really appreciate it. And for more strategic tips on international tax and wealth planning, subscribe to our email list and follow us on LinkedIn. Links are below. Welcome to our latest video. How do I control my trust? This is a question a lot of people have when they're contemplating setting up a trust or foundation. They still want to be able to have control of their assets and dictate what happens with their hard earned wealth. And today that's exactly what we're going to be answering in this video. Before we get started though, if you're not familiar with term with trust terminology, like protectors and beneficiaries or foundation, uh, vocabulary like founders and guardians and counselors, I would suggest you watch our introduction to trusts and our introduction to foundations videos to gain a little familiarity with the terminology and then come back to this video because you'll get a lot more out of it. As always, I'm going to start off my video with a disclaimer. This presentation is prepared for education purposes only. This presentation is not legal, tax, or any other type of advice. Each individual circumstances are different. You should seek legal and or tax advice to address any specific questions you may have. Let's get into it. So one of the easiest ways to maintain control of your trust is to use what's called a private trust company. A private trust company is essentially a company that you set up for the specific purpose of acting as the trustee of your trust. And you can be a director of that company. And in many jurisdictions, you can be the sole director of that company, which essentially gives you unfettered control of the trust assets within the terms set forth in the trust agreement, of course. So while a lot of people like the sound of this because it lets them maintain control of their assets, it's not without risk. I don't like it when somebody has unfettered control of their assets within a trust because I think the risks are too great. I think there's better ways to structure it. And I'm just going to talk about what some of those risks are. So first of all, there's an asset protection risk, right? So if, for example, you're a beneficiary of your trust and you're also the sole director of your private trust company, if you had some debts or liabilities that you needed to pay and a court was ordering you to pay those, well, the judge could just order you as the director of your PTC to make a distribution to yourself. That doesn't offer you much asset protection. Likewise, if you have too much control over your assets, it's possible that tax authorities will still consider you to be the owner of those assets for tax purposes and subject, subject you to tax on the income generated by the assets within the trust. Obviously, that's super not tax advantageous if tax benefits were one of the things that you were looking for in setting up your trust. Additionally, if you're managing your private trust company from within a country that has income taxes, it's possible that that country could say that there's a permanent establishment in that country because it's being managed from there and therefore the private trust company is liable for taxes in that country. So a good example of this is let's say, for example, you have a PTC uh, here in the UAE, but you're managing it from the UK. The UK could take the position that because you are managing the UAE PTC in the UK, that its central control and management is in the UK, and therefore the UAE company is a tax resident of the UK and liable for taxes there. So you really want to be careful with stuff like that. Um, and there are ways, of course, to mitigate both the asset protection and the tax risks. Uh, one of those is to have additional board members on the PTC's board, preferably in different jurisdictions, right? Because if you have two board members and you, let's say you need a unanimous decision to make it to, to, for the trustee to act, you could have one director in the UK, one director in, let's say, Germany, but neither one of them have the authority to manage the PTC by themselves. It would be very difficult for Germany or the UK to argue that the central control and management is in either one of those countries because both are required to act, right? Likewise, you now have directors in different jurisdictions. So if a UK court, for example, ordered the UK director to act, they don't have authority to order the German 
director to act. A German court would need to do that. And because both are need, both directors are needed for the PTC to act, you have some asset protection there, right? So it's good to split your board members in different jurisdictions, not just for asset protection reasons, but also for tax reasons. Now, it's also possible to accomplish something similar using a strong protector provision, right? So you could, for example, say um, that in order for the trust to make any distributions, the protector consent is required. And so if you put that protector in a different jurisdiction as the trustee, you're also sort of splitting the authority and the ability for certain actions to take place, right? Because a court could order the trustee of which you are the sole director to make a distribution, but the distribution can't happen without the protector's consent and the protector is in a different jurisdiction over which the court where you live doesn't have jurisdiction. So that creates uh, a lot of protection. So my suggestion is if you are using a PTC, well, it does give you a lot of control over your trust assets. It does come with tax and asset protection risks. So I would urge you in structuring your PTC to structure the board in a way that mitigates the tax and asset protection risks and or use a protective provision. I mean, sometimes structuring the board in an optimal way and using a protective provision is the best way. Now, another way that you can maintain control over your trust assets in a more passive way is if you are not a director of the BTC or you're using a professional trust company, you can serve as the protector of your trust. So you can specify certain things within the trustee. So for example, you can specify that the trustee needs to keep the, prof the, the protector informed about all matters, all trust matters uh, of which the protector needs to be privy to in order to exercise their powers and duties and, and, and rights effectively. So that would give you tremendous access to trust information. Likewise, you can give the protector the power to remove and replace the trustee. So if you don't like what the trustee's doing or the trustee isn't acting in your best interest, you don't like the way they're managing assets, then you as a protector would have the right to remove and replace that trustee. You can also put additional powers in there so that, for example, the trustee can't make distributions without the consent of you, the protector, or that the trustee can't engage in financial transactions over a certain dollar limit, for example, without the protector consent, or uh, beneficiaries can't be added or removed from the trust without your consent as the protector. And then you can put in additional terms like you, know, you can't amend the trust or change the jurisdiction of the trust without the consent of the protector. So this is sort of a more passive way of controlling the trust where the trustee is still fully managing the trust, but you as the protector sort of have a veto power. And now one thing that is important when you are drafting the protector provisions of your trust is not to give the protector too much power. You don't want the protector's powers to impede on the trustee's ability to effectively administer the trust because that can also have negative consequences like the protector being considered the trustee or you know, it can also pose asset protection and potentially even some tax risks if the protector has too much power. So it's a very delicate balancing act between protecting the, the you know, protecting your rights as, as the settler and, and, and acting as a protector without impeding the trustee's ability to act. Now, a final way for you to have control over trust assets is to act as an investment advisor. You can draft your trust or foundation's governing documents that the investment advisor must be consulted by the trustee or the foundation's board when making investment decisions. Now, depending on your preferences, you can give different strength to the investment, provisor, investment advisor provisions. One is you can say that the trustee must seek counsel from the investment advisor but the trustee doesn't necessarily need to follow the advice of the investment advisor, or you can draft it that the trustee must follow the advice of the investment advisor. 
I don't particularly like drafting it that the trustee must follow the advice of the investment advisor because I think that gives the investment advisor too much power and can also pose some potential uh, risks. In, my, in practice, the trustees are, are usually very happy to be sort of alleviated of the responsibility of making investment decisions. So they're happy to rely on an investment, on the advice of an investment advisor. So in my experience, usually it's just saying that they have to consult the investment advisor, but they don't necessarily have to follow the advice of the investment advisor is the best option because in practice, they normally follow the advice of the investment advisor, unless there's really a good reason not to. So depending on how you structure the investment advisor provisions of your trust, this gives you the power or at least the influence over investment decisions involving trust assets. I hope that you found this information useful. If you have any questions about how to structure investment advisor provisions, we're here to help. Our contact details are up on the screen now. Thank you.